What to do when you forget things or forget to do things in, in the Salah? And I, I think we had a couple of questions about this in one of the previous classes and I, I said uh, we would cover this uh, separately. Um, so sometimes you can face a situation where you might be confused, you've lost track of how many rakat you've done in the Salah. Have I done three? Have I done four? Have I done two? Have I done three? Um, and sometimes you can just just lose track this can happen to yourself when you're praying alone uh, this can happen to an imam who's who's leading the prayer uh, this is quite natural for, for for it to happen it happened during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, so firstly we need to try we need to remember the importance of concentration in the prayer um, we, we need to if this is happening to us very often we we're always losing track we we need to take a step back and think about what we can do to establish a better uh, concentration and attention during the prayer. And, and this will be a subject that we will we'll talk about separately, how to, how to get better concentration and uh, attention in the prayer. Uh, but it is quite natural from time to time that you, you might experience these situations where you, you do forget. Um, I'll go on to explaining what those situations are in, in just a minute, but I, I want to just introduce the, 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 the action that needs to be done uh, when you're in this state of, um, of forgetfulness. And there is uh, prostrations that are, that are offered. It's called sajda sahu, or, or the prostration of forgetfulness. Uh, and this is offered uh, at, at the end of the prayer. So what I'd like to do first is just explain the procedure uh, for offering the sajda sahu or the, the prostration of forgetfulness. Uh, and then I'll go through some examples of situations when you would offer this um, 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 sajda sahu. Um, now depending on the school of fiqh, there's a, a difference in how the sajda sahu is offered. Uh, in the shafi fiqh, uh, how it's offered is... Um, just before you do the salam, so you got assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So just before you do the, fi the, the final salutation on each side, you offer two additional prostrations. Okay? So you, you sit in the tashahud position, um, you say the tashahud, you say the durood, you say the dua, uh, and then before you do the salam, uh, you offer two extra prostrations. You sit in between uh, the two prostrations and then you do the salam. Okay, so this is how we do it in the Shafi fiqh, Shafi school of fiqh. Um, now in other schools of fiqh, like in the Hanafi school of fiqh, uh, what is done is um, in the final rakat, uh, you say the, the, the shahud, the first part, you say, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wa la sharika, you raise your finger. And then you do one salam. Say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Then you offer um, the two extra prostrations, which is the sajda suhu. You sit, and then you, you say the whole um, tashahud, the dua, the durud, and the dua. And then you offer the, the, the salam. So these are two ways in which sajda sahu is, is, is offered. Okay, so. As I said, in the, the former, the Shafi school, uh, we offer two additional um, sajdas or prostrations just before the salam. Okay, in other schools like the Hanifi school, uh, they do one salam first after the tashahud. You do the two prostrations and then you do the tashahud in full, the durood and the dua, and then you do the salam. Okay, so these are two different ways in which the... Um, Sajda Sahu is, is offered. Okay. So there are differences in opinion. Uh, so the question, the question was, can I explain the, the schools? The procedure or? No, the schools. What do you mean by schools? Because I don't know. Schools of thoughts. Schools of fiqh. Schools of fiqh. Okay. So there are different ways that the, the various hadith uh, have been interpreted by, by scholars. 
Um, and following these hadith, um, depending on certain rules that are established uh, within different schools of fiqh, uh, it's possible to arrive at a certain interpretation of those hadith. Uh, and a different scholar might arrive at a different interpretation of, of those hadith. Okay, so these are scholars that we very much respect. We don't say any one is wrong or the other one is right, um, uh, and we respect their um, position on on these um, uh, issues. Um, and depending on which school you follow, okay, you you follow whichever one you, you're following. This is fine. Um, there is a difference in opinion, and these scholars uh, have sat down, they've even prayed behind each other, uh, and they respect their differences in position on these fiqh issues. These are not differences in uh, opinion regarding aspects of Aqidah, or, or the beliefs that we have. These are uh, differences in opinion uh, regarding uh, certain technical matters about whether you do this in the prayer, you do that in the prayer, uh, or, or, or other aspects of legal jurisprudence uh, and, and, and so forth. So these differences amongst the scholars are something that uh, we should not be concerned about that there are differences in opinion. Okay, these are, it's acceptable to have differences in opinion uh, and we respect all of these differences in opinion. Uh, so if somebody um, prays a different way to us, uh, we respect that, that they pray differently to us and they have uh, a school of fiqh, they have their um, scholars that they are following uh, and, and, and this is fine, alhamdulillah. Initially it was not meant to be school of thoughts. These are scholars who excelled in scholarship to understand the best what, how to codify the issues of salat, the issues of zakat, the issues of uh, how to make wudu and it's only in these matters really. It's the, the detail of the technicalities. As he said, it's not the issues of faith, the major things that there is no difference among scholars in those. What has happened is that these scholars, as they dwelled into these matters, I remember each one in his own period. Some of them, as he said, they lived in the same era and they prayed behind each other, but not all of them. And so one scholar, for example, based his opinion on a given saying of the Prophet ﷺ that has reached him at his time. Another scholar came later. That scholar knows the hadith that the previous scholar based his opinion on, but he has also, another hadith has reached him that is also authentic, and therefore based on that second hadith, he say, well, really we should do it this way, based on the new evidence. And so it is um, an excellence in knowledge, rather than looking for differences. They never meant it to be school of thoughts. They were individual uh, uh, efforts to understand the deen based on the evidence that reached them. And so it's the followers that made of them school of thoughts. And so for you sisters and for us all today, it is okay if you are brought up on a given school of thought, that's fine. For you, you don't need to be in this matter at all. You follow what is authentic based on what you read. Today, alhamdulillah, today, scholars have written books on how salat should be. Period. How salat, how Rasulullah performed his salat without getting into the school of thought of uh, Al-Ahnaf or Shafi'i or Al-Maliki and so forth. Uh, I was listening to Brother Ishfaq, for example. The, they are another school of thought that say, if you make a mistake that is diminishing in salat, for example, you forget something, so you have not really made your salat complete. Then you make sujood before you make salam. And if you exceed, you add something to salat out of your uh, forgetfulness, then you make sujood after you make the salam. 